The <clears throat> Old Testament reading has been changed. My apologies. Psalm 116, 12 through 19. Psalm 116, 12 through 19. The Leviticus passage I had selected tells about leprosy in the Old Testament and the priest pronouncing someone clean or unclean. But uh, I decided to go with this passage about thankfulness in Psalm 116, verses 12 through 19. God's Word. Let's hear God's Word. What shall I render to the Lord for all His benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all His people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. O Lord, truly I am Your servant. I am Your servant, the son of Your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all His people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. And the New Testament reading from Luke 17, 11 through 19. Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice glorified God. And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And thus we end the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Let us sing from the Trinity hymnal, number 59. Number 59.
Let us bow together for prayer. Our Father, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you that it is forever settled in the heavens. We thank you that it is the firm and sure truth that anchors our souls. We thank you that we can turn to this written word in times of trial and temptation, in times when we are down and discouraged, even when we are confused and don't know the way forward. And we thank you that this word points us to our only Savior, our only hope, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the Spirit who gave it to us, who gave it to men to write down and who illumines our minds to understand it. So we pray for his work now as we look into this text. Feed us, O Lord, feed us, we pray. Show us our sins, show us our Savior. Remind us of our hope. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. This morning we were driving down from Raleigh and had a Christian radio station on and the teacher was teaching the International Sunday School lesson for today. But before he began, he said, I want to tell you that we appreciate you listeners. I want to thank you for your faithful listening. We don't want to take our audience for granted. And that's one thing that we human beings find easy to do. We don't find it easy to do, it just is easy to do because we're not often paying attention to what others do for us, to what God has done for us as we should be. This is a lesson in thanksgiving, thanksgiving to God, glorifying God, trusting God that we have before us today. The Lord Jesus Christ is headed in a southerly direction toward Jerusalem for the last week of his life. There was a big turning point in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 9, verse 51, when we are told he steadfastly set his face toward Jerusalem. He's heading there now. And soon in the Gospel of Luke, he will reach that city and make his triumphal entry. And in that last fateful week of his life, that predetermined, decreed last week of his life. He knows how it ends. He's been teaching his disciples he would have to suffer at the hands of sinful men and be crucified. He also is telling his disciples he would rise from the dead. His disciples are trying to take this in. And as he travels in that southerly direction toward the city, he is teaching, he is doing miracles as he normally did in the rest of his ministry. He happens to come upon 10 lepers in our text for this morning. This incident is not recorded in any of the other three gospels. This is the only account that we have of this event in the life of Jesus. And the key thought we want to see here is that when Jesus Christ has mercy on us, we must glorify him, thank him, and trust him. We need to glorify him, thank him, and trust him. Jesus asks a provoking question, which I've used as my title, where are the nine? There were ten cleansed, but he asks, where are the nine? Under these three headings, first, Jesus Christ has mercy on the ten lepers and heals them. He has mercy on the ten lepers and heals them. Secondly, 
One leper glorifies God and thanks Him. There's only one who glorifies and thanks God. And then thirdly, Jesus draws attention to the faith of this Samaritan leper. He draws attention to the man's faith. First of all, Jesus Christ has mercy on the ten lepers and heals them from verses 11 through 14. Verse 11 tells us he was traveling through Samaria and Galilee. He was somewhere around the border of Samaria and Galilee when this happens. Well, this was farther north than Luke had told us Jesus has progressed in his journey, so this may have happened earlier. Luke isn't always going by chronological order. Sometimes he's going by logical order. But at any rate, here he is at the Samaria and Galilee border, and verse 12 says he entered a certain village. We don't know the exact name of this village, but there 10 lepers met Jesus. And leprosy was a skin disease of varying degrees. It could cause a whitening effect to the skin, and if it got really bad, it could turn into raw flesh. But the damage that leprosy did on a person was not only physical, it was psychological, emotional. It was even spiritual because it caused the victim to be isolated from the community if it got into its more serious stages. And you know about isolation from recent years. You've been isolated, most of you probably, as I have and my wife has, and it's no fun. And we have also noticed, and even the news is telling us, that it has had more than physical effects on people, but psych psychological effects as well. It's kept people from church, had spiritual effects as well. Well, so did leprosy, and verse 12 tells us that these men stood afar off. They were considered to be ceremonially unclean. They were ceremonially unclean. They could not join in the worship of God's people. They could not have the fellowship they once had. So there they were. In order to rejoin society, they had to be pronounced clean by a priest. Until then, they continued in isolation. There was a Jewish belief that leprosy was the direct result of God's putting it on people for their sins. And when we read the Old Testament, in fact, that did happen, didn't it, on occasion, that did actually happen. It happened to Miriam for her contempt of Moses. It happened to Joab for killing Abner. It happened to King Uzziah when he acted as a priest and went into the temple and burned incense on the altar of incense. But we know then and now not every disease is something inflicted directly by God. Can it be? Yes, it can be. But it's not always, and we're not to be the judge of that, whether God did it or not, because we just don't know. So the lepers made a request in verse 13. They lifted up their voices. They still had their voices. Sometimes the voice was taken away. They still had their voices, and in verse 13 they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. They recognized him as master, whether it was, well, superficial or not. They called him master. And they called upon him for mercy. And mercy is compassion combined with doing something about the condition of the person on whom one has compassion. So it's 
pity plus doing something. That's mercy. And they pled for mercy. And Jesus was going to have mercy on them, just like he has mercy on his people and saves them from sin. That's what's so remarkable about salvation. It's of the Lord's mercy. It's something that we don't deserve. It's something that we could never do for ourselves. It's something that I cannot do for you and you could not do for me. Jesus saves us by mercy. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5 tell us about mercy. But God, who is rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. It was God who was merciful to us. He saw us in our poor and needy estate of sin. And he had pity on us and he had compassion on us, but he didn't stop there. He did something about it, being rich in mercy. He loved us and through Christ made us alive when we were dead in sin. We were hopeless, we were helpless, but he had mercy. And again in Titus 3 verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Titus 3 verse 5, according to his mercy, it was certainly not by works of righteousness which we have done. Even the things which we did before we were saved that were good for other people were not good works in the sight of God because we weren't doing it for God's glory. And even now some of the things that we do that actually help other people are not necessarily good works depending on our motives. And there's still the taint of sin there. How we need God's mercy. According to his mercy, he saved us, not by our works. Jesus is our merciful and faithful high priest who not only had mercy on these lepers, but he had mercy on all of us who know salvation. And so, we should be thankful. Jesus cleanses the lepers in verse 14. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, they were cleansed. As the men went to the priests, they were cleansed. Jesus told them to go show themselves to the priests. The priests could look at them, examine them, make their examination, and then pronounce them clean. They could return to society and to the privileges they previously enjoyed. They could be healthy again. They would be. They were healthy again. Go show yourselves to the priests, Jesus says. He went by the Old Testament law in Leviticus 13 and 14. He did not touch them. In another case, he had touched a leper. Here he did not touch them. He did not say, I heal you. He just willed it. He just willed it to happen because he has the power, he has the authority to heal and to heal in any way he chooses because he is almighty God. So that's what he did for these men. He didn't touch them. He just healed them. So he sent them to the priests according to the Old Testament law. And not only could the priests pronounce them clean, but they could bear witness to the fact that they were healed by Jesus Christ. They could see the evidence right in front of their faces 
that Jesus had made this healing, had done this healing. And as they went, they were cleansed, says verse 14. They were healed. As they obeyed the command of Jesus, they were blessed. They were healed. This is how blessing comes to us. When we are in the way of obedience, blessing comes to us. Don't expect to be blessed when you're disobeying the Lord. Sometimes he does anyway. I mean, we all disobey. But the way of real blessing is the way of obedience. These men went their way and they were healed. That's the first point. Jesus healed the lepers. Secondly, one leper, one, glorifies God and thanks Him in verses 15 through 18. In verse 15, we're told about the one who returned and glorified God. The nine men got what they needed, what they wanted. They just proceeded to the priests. They just went their way. They got what they wanted. And many people have and do join Christ's church for selfish reasons to use it. Perhaps that's not done as much now as it was in the past. It certainly was done a lot more when I was fresh in the ministry 40-some years ago. People don't seem to care much anymore. But people have taken advantage of the blessings of God or tried to by coming into the fellowship of God's people just to get those blessings, those outward blessings. And that's all. One Sunday morning, we were getting ready for church in my last pastorate in Mount Vernon, New York. And this was, to us, this was kind of an urban setting, though it was suburban New York. It was on a street in a city of 70,000 people. There were houses around and a few blocks was downtown and so this guy comes in and he looks to be homeless. He's filthy. He wants help. He came to me and I said before the service started, if you sit here through the service, well, this was stupid. I said, I'll give you $20. I don't recommend that. <laughs> but that Sunday morning, that's what I did. I said, if you'll sit here and listen to this sermon and worship with us, I'll give you $20. Well, he was gone in 10 minutes. Couldn't wait an hour. That happens, you know. People use God. We human beings, not just non-Christians, we Christians can make an attempt to actually use God for our selfish purposes. I've been guilty, you've been guilty, we're all guilty of doing this. Serving God selfishly. <laughs> Romans 1.21 says, Although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Romans 1.21 They were not thankful. We are not either sometimes. 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2 says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves. I tell you, if anything was written for us in this generation, that was, wasn't it? Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. 
2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2. Would you imagine when you see a list of sins like this, lovers of self, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedience to parent, disobedient to parents, unholy. Would you imagine unthankful would be in that list? It is. That really says something, doesn't it? How unthankful are we? But one man, out of the ten, one man had a sense of his own indebtedness. He had a sense of the mercy of Jesus Christ. Now, do the math. Is that representative of the world today? I don't know. One-tenth. That's not many, is it? In this case, it was representative. It was the fact. One out of ten gave thanks. He came back in verse 15 and with a loud voice glorified God. He glorified God with a loud voice. And that Greek family of words is the word from which we get our word doxology. Doxa. Doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God who healed me, said the leper in essence. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Glorify him for his healing of me. We can say that because he healed us from our sinful estate and saved us. Praise be to God. We are taught to pray, hallowed be thy name. God is to be glorified. And it's, it's so difficult for us human beings because we naturally want to glorify ourselves. So, with a loud voice, he glorified God. And then in verse 16, on his face before Jesus, he gave thanks. He glorified God. He gave thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 16. He knew that this healing was by the mercy of Christ. So he shows this by an act of devotion, a gesture of devotion. He bows down before him at his feet. Glorified God, he thanked the Lord Jesus Christ. And by now you're thinking, I hope, by now you're thinking, how can I show my thanksgiving to God? Well, I'm glad you asked. As a matter of fact, did you notice that in Psalm 116? I'm turning back to Psalm 116 for a moment. Did you notice that very question in verse 12 of Psalm 116? What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? How about that? That's almost exactly the same question, isn't it? How can I show my thanksgiving? What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? And see in verse 13 of Psalm 116, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will believe in him. I will trust him for my salvation. That's where it begins. When God gives us his spirit, causes us to be born again, the first thing is we thank God for our salvation. We put our trust in him. That's how we show our thanksgiving in the beginning. And then... Verse 14, I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Verse 16, nope, let's just stick with 14, paying vows. Verse 18, I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Again, verse 14 and verse 18. You and I took vows before the Lord. We vowed to turn from sin and obey the Lord as the Holy Spirit enables us. 
God helping us, we will vow, we vow to follow the Lord and obey his commands. And we don't do that perfectly. We fail many times. But that's our vow, and that's part of our worship of the Lord. We worship him, we surrender ourselves to him, we make vows to him. And God gives us the Ten Commandments telling us what that life looks like. Loving God and loving our neighbor. Very simple commands, aren't they? You don't have to explain to your children. Thou shalt not bear false witness. You shall not lie. Our children know what that means. They know what it means not to steal. Those are very easy to understand and very hard to do. But that's the way we show thanks to God. By our obedience to those vows. And then there's worshiping Him. Verse, seven, verse 17 in Psalm 116. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. Public worship is so important. Worshiping with God's people. That's what he commands. I, I know it's been said. Uh, you know, I, I can actually learn more at home studying my Bible by myself. First of all, that's not true. There are things you can learn on your own, and you should, and I should, study on my own. But God calls us to worship him as a body in his church. And that's one way you show thanks as well. And then there's the fellowship of God's people. I will pay my vows to the Lord, verse 18, now in the presence of all his people. In the courts, verse 19, of the Lord's house. In the midst of you, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. We need each other. We need each other to build each other up. And sometimes it's necessary, but only when it's necessary to gently rebuke one another. We need each other. And that's how we show thanks. Notice this, the man who gave thanks to Jesus was a Samaritan. Totally unexpected by the Jewish people, in general, by the Jewish people, because they hated the Samaritans and vice versa. Foreigner, Jesus says. Is this foreigner the only one who comes to give thanks? It would be unexpected by the Jewish people in that day. And Jesus was teaching as he approached Jerusalem over and over again by his parables and teaching, by his direct words, he was teaching the Jewish people, your time is running out. And here's this Samaritan who came to me to give thanks. And he was trying to convey to them If they rejected Christ, there would be dire circumstances. There would be dire consequences. And he says that same thing to us today. Now, back in Luke 17, in verses 17 and 18, he asks three questions. Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? The sin of ungratefulness, the sin of not glorifying God. You see, it's, it's worse. This is, this is hard to believe, but it's true. It's worse to be ungrateful than it is to be a leper. It's worse to be ungrateful than it is to have cancer. 
So the second point, the Samaritan glorifies God and thanks Jesus. Thirdly, Jesus draws attention to the Samaritan's faith in verse 19. And he said to him, Arise, go your way, your faith has made you well. Get up from the ground, resume your life, your faith has made you well. Commentators disagree on this point and some say he only had faith to be healed and others say he had real faith to be saved. It's not clear, certainly it's not spelled out word for word, and you are saved from your sins and you will go to heaven. But it's also true that this word for well here in verse 19 is also the word that's translated save in Matthew 1.21 Call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. In Matthew 1, 21, it's also the word translated saved in Acts 2, 21. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Acts 2, 21. So, there's good reason to believe that he had true faith in Jesus Christ and that he was saved. The nine walked away. The Samaritan, the one, could not walk away. He came to the feet of Jesus and thanked him. True faith involves more than head knowledge. It involves a commitment to the Lord. It involves a relying upon the Lord, a resting upon him, a trusting in him day by day. In 1 John 5, 4 and 5, the apostle wrote, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. 1 John 5, 4 and 5. We have many enemies who would fight against us as we have faith in Jesus Christ and trust in him. Two of them are outward. The world, the non-believing world, which wants to go its own way and puts us in a position where if we follow Jesus Christ, we have to go against the current. All our lives, we're going against the current. We're going upstream, and we can't make it upstream on our own. We have to have the strength of Jesus Christ and we have to depend on Him every day because every day you are going to be challenged, whether it's just these silly little advertisements that you hear trying to sell you stuff or whether it's your best friend who is not a believer. The world. But then there's the devil. And I, I suppose... I suppose in Presbyterian churches we don't talk much about the devil. But let's not forget him. Let's remember that he's working. Let's remember that he has demons all over the place. There is a spiritual world. There is an actual being, an evil angel called the devil, and he has demons and they are working. And they're working against you. There is nothing good about the devil. Nothing. He is after your soul. And he can't get it if you're elect. If you belong to Jesus, he can't get it. But he can really influence us by his demons to do some pretty dumb things. And to be bad witnesses. And he can make us uncomfortable. And that's a part of life every day you live. Then there's an internal enemy. Right here. It's called the flesh. 
the world, the devil, and the flesh. Your own and my own sinful desires. Now, if you tell me, if you tell me, I don't have any sinful desires, I beg to disagree. I really beg to disagree. You think you don't have any sinful desires? I hope you don't think that. Because <laughs> that's, that's crazy. You're still a human being, and I'm still a human being, and we haven't been glorified yet. And so we have these three things working against us every day in trying to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is a continuing thing. Faith is a persevering thing. Faith is something that through Jesus Christ gains the victory. Thank God. Thank God that He gives us faith. We don't have to be strong in ourselves. We have the strength of Christ who lives in us. But my friends, don't ignore the foes. If ever an army went to war and said, there's no enemy, they would be defeated in a very short time. <laughs> they really would. Beware the foes. But our Savior is the conquering Savior who defeats all his foes. Thanks be to him. The Samaritan's faith is emphasized here. So Jesus cleanses and heals ten lepers. He had mercy on them. He asked a question, where are the nine? Where are the others? By the grace of God, one answered positively, glorified God, thanked Jesus, and trusted him. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are rich in mercy, that you are rich in mercy to us sinners. Help us to have faith like this leper did. Help us to glorify you to thank you and trust you.